Dear friends, welcome back to my show. Let me preface this video by stating that this is not a political video per se. It is a political evaluation of a literary personality and his literary output as a measure of his true political affiliations. And the video goes on to propose an outrageous claim of a possible suspect RSS mole in the Congress. Nobody has talked about this and nobody has ever put up this theory. So please watch and listen to my argument. The preposterous claim made in this video is that Shashi Tharoor, a well-known Indian politician from the Congress party, is actually a mole of the RSS who has been planted into the Congress. He is actually a khaki chaddiwala dressed in an impeccable lounge suit. As all of you know, a premise is a claim or a statement that supports a conclusion. I am working on the premise that most novels and works of fiction are actually a medium of expression of the political affiliations of an author. We will build on this premise or foundation. In order to support my argument, I must have some rooting or basis in philosophy. I shall apply the classical Indic basis for my argument, one that is rooted in Nyaya school of philosophy as also in Mimamsa and Yoga. Starting with the first one, which is Pratyaksha Praman. Pratyaksha Praman relates to perception something that can be seen, touched, felt, tasted, etc. However, we must realize that there is a limitation to this particular point of discussion. Because I am making the claim that Mr. Tharoor is an undercover agent or a mole. Then by definition, pratyaksh or perception cannot be applied because a spy whose cover has been blown is not a spy anymore. So we have to look beyond just perception or that which can be seen, felt, heard, tasted, smelt. However, there are three other remaining supports for our argument and these are the classical ones. The first one being Anumana. Anumana is inference and as the theory builds up, you will agree that we can infer the proposition made in the beginning. The next strong one is Shabda or testimony. What can be a better testimony than the works or expressions of the person in question? We shall analyze each of these and you will then agree with me that we have ample of Shabda or testimonial evidence. The last one of course is Upamana which is analogy or comparison. The literary works presented or discussed here give us ample opportunity and I am certain that by the end of this video you will be in congruence with me in my views. Now friends, here is the popular picture one has in mind when we think of the word Shashi Tharoor. Not only is it very entertaining, it is also very educative. What's the meaning of Fluxinosi Nihilibilification, Defenestrate, Agathocacological, Panglossian, Quach? Friends, here is a glossary of terms for the uninitiated. Tharoor is known to most people for his witty use of difficult English words as we saw earlier. But he is also a prolific writer. And best of all, his books are very readable. He has also been a diplomat in the United Nations and is now a politician. He is an elected member of parliament for the Indian National Congress, which holds less than 10% of the seats in the Lok Sabha. A mole is a deep cover penetration agent planted into an enemy camp. A mole by definition must be indistinguishable from the enemy where he operates. He must act, dress, speak and appear to be one of them. In other words, indistinguishable. With his command over the English language, his foreign education, his diplomatic career, makes him one of the favorite ones of the left liberal secular crowd. In fact, 
he is one of them indistinguishable once again the third important word is rss rashtriya swayam sevak sangh it's the so called or labeled as a right wing nationalistic outfit with ideas and ideals like swadeshi bharat mata national pride and having a civilizational outlook for india not a constitutional outlook but a civilizational and it prides itself for the many a millennia of history and its legends its itihas to the left liberal secular brigade rss is a bunch of hindi speaking hindutva bigots quite opposite to themselves and the polar opposite of what appears to be tharur the congress or the indian national congress as you all know is a registered political party but it is actually a dynastic indian political family the fundamental premise of this video is that authors express their personal political opinion through the medium of their novels for example george orwell whose picture you see on the screen was a strong opponent of communism and totalitarian rule and his works like animal farm in 1984 expressed exactly that radyard kipling another author quite closely associated with india was a great champion of imperialism and colonization and his stories expressed exactly the same as a matter of fact he considered the white race to be far superior and that such inferior races as indians should accept their governed position as colonies another great champion of the cause for the marginalized people be they peasants widows or prostitutes was the great hindi story teller munshi prem chand i particularly feel that he deserved a nobel much like radyard kipling did or even more but then of course all prizes are tainted with some politics or the other and i am sure you will understand why munshi prem chand never made it while ravindranath tagore did in this video we shall be discussing tharur's first novel the great indian novel well that's the title of the book the great indian novel and it was published in 1989 it's actually a translation of these words great stands for ma bharat stands for indian and if you combine the two words what you get is the mahabharat this novel is actually an allegory based on the epic mahabharat using characters from modern history in particular the freedom struggle and of course the political leadership right up to the 90s or just before the book was published although the great indian novel was the first work of fiction published or written by tharur he had published one more book before that in 1982 and it was based on his doctoral thesis on foreign affairs and actually it was a very strong critique or criticism of indira gandhi's foreign policy this book currently is not available across the counter or even online you might get this message if you go to amazon currently unavailable and we don't know when or if this item will be back in stock that makes it all the more interesting since it is having an aura of mystery about it the next book that followed was the great indian novel the plot of the great indian novel as we said earlier was based on mahabharat the great epic of india and it deals with the political hegemony of the nehru gandhi family it has all the ingredients of fiction humor sarcasm parody and of course it is an allegory you will certainly enjoy if you read the original but i am trying to compress this into a few minutes of video once again for the uninitiated mahabharat is an epic written by ved vyas it is not mythology it is what is called in indic culture as itihasa 
which is a historical account. It is about the dynastic struggle for power and it is dated to have occurred around 5561 before Common Era. This date is pretty definitive because it is based not just on heresy, but it is based on many fields of inquiry and science. And that credit goes to Nilesh Nilkant Oak, a scholar who has devoted more than 20 years using various techniques which included astronomical references in the text, oceanographic records, geological records, account of various records of anthropology and much, much more. As we saw, it was a dynastic struggle for power and it includes a beautiful account of the virtues and failings of humans. Every historical epic has villains and protagonists. The villains in this particular case, both the Mahabharata as well as the great Indian novel are the Kauravas. And there are characters such as Dhritarashtra, Duryodhan, Dushasan and others who are essentially doing very nasty acts, inhuman acts. On the side of protagonists are the Pandavas, which includes Yudhishthir and his four brothers, Arjun, Bhim, Nakul, Sahadev, and many other people, including princes and kings, who come to their support. Kauravas represent the following archetypes. They are cheats and gamblers. They are misogynists. They believe in disrobing and dishonoring women in their court. They are violent and there is total absence of rule of law in their worldview. In direct contrast, the archetypes that Pandavas represent are justice, valor, equanimity, compassion, humility and reflection over action done. What Mr. Tharoor has done very artfully is that he overlays personalities in recent Indian history. By recent, I mean the period of freedom struggle and politics until the beginning of the 90s in India. And these, of course, include M.K. Gandhi, J.L. Nehru, Sardar Patel, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Lord Mountbatten and Indira Gandhi. Of course, they do not appear with these names in the great Indian novel. They are substituted with characters from the great Indian epic that is Mahabharata. And that is why he calls his book the great Indian novel. Here is a famous quote where Vyasarishi is talking to Lord Ganesha or Ganapati who is his scribe. Talking of family trees, Veda Vyas says that family trees are versatile plants. In our country, incompetence and mediocrity also flourish under the shade of their leafy branches. What can be a better example? Because every subsequent generation of the Nehru Gandhi family fits into this particular sentence or description. Now friends, I will ask you to be a little patient because this particular slide is the family tree of the Kuru Vansh or the Kuru dynasty. Shantanu is from the Kuru dynasty and is wedded to Ganga. And he has one offspring from Ganga, which is Bhishma, or as he was known in childhood as Dev Datta. In the novel, this character is called Ganga Dutt or simply Ganga Ji and he represents M.K. Gandhi. Shantanu of course also fell in love with Satyavati who was a fisherwoman who lived on an island with her father. She is very ambitious and also very beautiful. So Shantanu falls in love with her and she extracts a promise that it will only be her offsprings who will ascend the throne of Shantanu and not his son Ganga Dutt or Ganga Ji or Bhishma in the original epic. So Satyavati of course 
has had another son in her previous encounter with another sage, a sage known as Rishi Parashar. Rishi Parashar is of course the author of astrological science, Jyotish Vidya. And it is said that at one particular point he discovered that it was the most opportune time for a baby to conceive so that he would be one of the most learned persons. And indeed he sought out an alliance with Satyavati, the fisherwoman or the fisherman's daughter, who readily agreed and bore the son known as Ved Vyasa. Ved Vyasa is a real historical character, not a mythical one. In fact, he organized the entire knowledge of Vedas into four volumes as we know them today. Continuing further, Shantanu and Satyavati begat two sons, Chitrangad and Vichitravidya. I will not go into the details why they could not conceive kids and ultimately died childless, leaving their wives behind. And these wives were Ambika and Ambalika. With their husbands not alive anymore, Satyavati was in a big fix because she had extracted a promise or a vow from Gangadatji or Gangaji or Bhishma Pitama that he would not ascend the throne. So therefore she requested her first son Vedavyas to have an alliance with Ambika and Ambalika so that they could have children and produce heirs for the Kuru dynasty. So according the Vedavyasa, Ambika and Ambalika and there was a third maidservant who also had an alliance with Vedavyasa and they produced Dhritarashtra who is equated to Mr. J. L. Nehru who later became the Prime Minister of India. Dhritarashtra as you all know represents the fact that he is blind to reality. He is blind to reason. Being blind also means that that person is not agreeable to accept any kind of a praman which we referred to earlier. Dhritarashtra was the father of 100 Kauravas. But in the great Indian novel, he has just one offspring. And she is actually the distillation of all the ill virtues of the hundred Kauravas. And she is Priya Duryodhini. Mark the words Priya Duryodhini because this was the original name. Her name was Priya Darshini. And the daughter of Dhritarashtra of this novel, which is an allegory of Mr. J. L. Nehru, is Indira Gandhi. Ambalika bore Pandu and Pandu begat the five Pandavas. Well, not exactly begat because Pandu was also under a curse that if he were to have any association with his wife, he would die instantly. So the two wives actually got a boon of a mantra from Durvasa and therefore the Pandavas came into being. Interestingly, Priya Duryodhini or Dhritarashtra were actually biologically having no connection with the Kuru dynasty or Shantanu. Because if you follow these lines, you will find that they came from Vyasa. Pandavas, of course, were even more distant because they came through mantras given by Rishi Durvasa. The third offspring from Ved Vyasa was Vidura, but we are not going into it in this particular video. This was just a quick recap for those who are out of tune with Mahabharata. As we all know, Pandavas had married Draupadi and Draupadi was the daughter of King Drupad. In the great Indian novel, King Drupad is replaced by Lord Drupad, a fictional character whose wife is Lady Edwina. As you can recognize from these names, Lord Drupad is actually Mountbatten. And their fictitious doctor, uh, daughter is Draupadi Mokrasi. A funny name, but a very clever one. Because that abbreviates to democracy, which is actually democracy. And the reason why she chose the five Pandavas was because she needs the protection 
of these five virtues which they represent because they are going to be the parents of modern India. If democracy has to survive, you need all the five strengths and virtues of the five Pandavas all the time. Compare this now with the Itihasa or the history or as it happened. Duryodhini stripped democracy in full view of all. While the parliament was in session, at that time the emergency was declared. The Pandavas were banished. In other words, all these virtues were driven out of the country or they were imprisoned. The fundamental rights, judiciary, freedom of the press, everything was held hostage by none other than Priya Duryodhini. It is well known that in India, nobody will name their children with any of the Kaurava names. None. Nobody would like to have a son who is a Duryodhan or who is a Dushasan. Nobody likes to call their father a Dhritarashtra, not because he is blind, but for reasons which we have already understood in the video a little while ago. Now, would you agree or accept that Mr. Shashi Tharoor, who spent virtually his entire lifetime till 2006 when he retired from the United Nations outside India and yet he had such a beautiful understanding of a Hindu scripture of Itihas and he looked at the play of Duryodhini in front of his eyes. To call these icons of Congress party as the Kauravas requires not just courage, it requires one to be very artful as well. And this person joins the Congress. If you look at his very first book, Reasons of the State, that was also anti-Congress. However, using his suave, his beautiful personality, his good looks, his command over the English language, his wit, he finds an easy entry as a mole into the Congress camp. They rejoice. They parachute him to contest for an election in Kerala. And of course, he wins with a very popular majority. Then he gets Prime Minister Modi at the inaugural of one of his books, which you can see in this picture. But shortly before the 2019 election, he comes out with a book in which he makes a parody of the Prime Minister. And he announces that I am delighted to announce the publication of my new book, which is The Paradoxical Prime Minister. Now friends, don't be deceived by this mole. He was and is an RSS Chaddiwala. To his great grand good luck. The leaders in the Congress, particularly the Kaurava family members, are so illiterate that they have not read any of his works. To call Indira Gandhi as a Duryodhini and J.L. Nehru as a Dhritarashtra, there can be no bigger insult. But nobody in the Congress party has bothered to read his book. They have all fallen for his good looks, just as people fall for those lap dancers in Bangkok who are not even women and they are transgenders, but they delight everyone simply with their external looks. And the mole of RSS in the Congress camp is none other than Mr. Shashi Tharoor. So friends, let me sum up. I started at the beginning of this video with a hypothesis that Shashi Tharoor is a Chaddiwala RSS mole inside the Congress. We went through all the steps of the scientific method. Those steps are first develop a hypothesis, then gather evidence to support that hypothesis, which was also done at length. You can explore and examine all the evidence presented in this video into greater depth. Then we drew a conclusion on the basis of the evidence as well as the 
hypothetical assumptions. Finally, we reflected on the results and we can even predict things in the future. I'll leave that entirely to you. If you're not in agreement with what I have said, please don't make any hollow criticism. Don't be abusive. Come up with evidence to falsify the tenets of this argument. Please follow the scientific method, which has been mentioned at the beginning of this video. Meet all the requirements of Nyaya, Yoga and Mimamsa, and then we can carry on the discussion further. You are most welcome to replace this theory, but please follow the steps of the scientific method. Finally, if you agree, you can always choose to share, distribute and celebrate this information. Remember, most of such discoveries are met with intense amount of resistance. You don't have to be a Galileo or a Bruno. This happens almost every day in small measure. That's all I have to say for this video and thank you for all the attention. So friends, as you must have seen, the purpose of this video was to inculcate scientific temper in political analysis. My exercise to you is hunt out the other moles in other parties. Read what they write, hear what they utter, and watch how they behave. And you can draw your own conclusions and find out who the other moles are. So friends, thank you very much for your attention. We'll meet once again in another video. Thank you and bye-bye.